Good afternoon. I'm Ed Gallagher, uh, President of the American Scandinavian Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to our headquarters, Scandinavia House, the Nordic Center in America, for today's discussion on what to expect from Finland as a NATO member. Uh, it's a very happy occasion that happened a little over a month ago when NATO, uh, or Finland, was accepted into NATO as a formal member. And uh, we're going to hear a little more of what the long-range implications of that are from two very distinguished speakers today. Um, before I introduce them, though, I'd like to um, invite His Excellency Jarmo Sarova, the uh, Consul uh, General of Finland here in New York, to say a few words. Jarmo? Thank you, Ed. Um, it's a pleasure being at the Scandinavia House, uh, as always. Uh, I'd like to start by recognizing uh, the uh, Scandinavian American Foundation and Scandinavia House as an asset here in Midtown Manhattan. It's uh, wonderful to have this place for all Nordics to convene and to discuss important matters and also to uh, see Nordic culture uh, in action. Uh, my second point would be uh, to say how easy it is to represent Finland in the United States today. Uh, we are today better known than, uh, and I keep repeating this everywhere, so some of, some of you must have heard this maybe several times, but um, we're better known today than we have probably been ever before, um, at least since uh, the Winter War. Americans, both uh, on the two coasts and in the heartland, um, not only know where Finland is and who we are, but increasingly know what we stand for. And uh, our membership in NATO has not gone unnoticed, even among the man in the street. Uh, our bilateral relations uh, on all fronts have uh, strengthened. Uh, the United States surpassed Sweden, sorry Sweden, as our uh, largest export market uh, last year. Uh, this may be a one-off uh, uh, thing because uh, there was a spike due to the delivery of a major, uh, very uh, expensive uh, cruise ship. But the trend is there. Uh, our trade is up, and what uh, distinguishes uh, the U.S. market for uh, Finnish um, exporters is that uh, our exports have uh, traditionally been about 50-50 uh, between uh, goods and services, and service sector uh, export growth has been, um, has been very, very uh, robust. So it's easy uh, to, to be here and to promote uh, Finnish business, and also Finnish culture, uh, which is often uh, uh, which is uh, often presented and highlighted uh, here at the uh, Scandinavia House. Uh, this year is actually what we call uh, a super year for uh, Finnish culture uh, in New York. Uh, just last night, there was an awesome uh, concert by the Helsinki Philharmonic uh, Orchestra, conducted by uh, Maestra Susanna Malki um, at the Carnegie Hall. And I can say that uh, not one soul who attended that conference, um, not one came out not having been, and you can see I, I use double negatives, uh, uh, everybody came out um, with uh, uh, tears almost tears uh, in their eyes. Uh, now, finally, a few words about uh, Mika, who will be properly uh, introduced as, as, as Richard by, uh, by our host, by Ed. Uh, Mika not only uh, heads the Finnish Institute for International Affairs, uh, he's also one of the foremost uh, commentators of our time on Finnish foreign policy and uh, European security. And uh, not knowing fully what Mika will be uh, saying, um, I nevertheless suspect that 
that uh, one of the messages that he will be uh, telling us is how the master strategist has failed, uh, this being uh, Vladimir Putin. So with, this, with those words, uh, again, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, lovely to be here, and uh, I look forward to listening to an interesting uh, discussion. Thank you. Please. Well, I'd like to just uh, invite uh, Mika and uh, Richard to uh, take their seats. Uh, a brief introduction. You've already heard a bit about Mika. He is the director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. He is also a tenured professor of international relations and European Union affairs at Tallinn University and uh, holds the rank of docent at Tampere University. He's been a visiting fellow at Cambridge University and uh, Johns Hopkins, as well as a visiting professor at the University of Minnesota. He has published extensively on topics ranging from Finnish foreign policy to pandemic security to U.S. foreign and security policy. So he has great background to which to address the current issue. Um, we're also joined by uh, Richard Gowan, who oversees the International Crisis Group's advocacy work at the United Nations, liaising with diplomats and officials in New York. Richard was previously a consulting analyst, analyst with ICG from 2016 to 2017. He has worked with the European Council on Foreign Relations, the University Center on International Cooperation, and the Foreign Policy Center in London, and has taught at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University and Stanford also. Two uh, very distinguished men, and I look forward to hear what you say. Gentlemen. Good early afternoon to everybody. I'm really happy to be here uh, in New York, my former hometown. I studied here at Columbia University for five years, did my undergrad here. It was a privilege back in early 1990s when the Cold War was just over, and there was the U.S. moment, uh, moment of unipolarity. Quite a lot of things were changing. Soviet Union had collapsed. Very hopeful times, very progressive times. Berlin Wall came to tumbling down. People were eyeing towards the end of history. But of course, the history didn't end. I don't think that Russia, that was born in the ruins of uh, Soviet Union or China, were never settling to the mode of normalizing, liberalizing, democratizing, buying into the idea of interdependence, leading into peaceful times ahead, kind of the Kantian peace, peace uh, through trade. I don't think that they never believed in that paradigm. They waited for the moment. And last year, 24th of February, Putin thought that his moment had come. He saw the same images that we saw at the Kabul airport when the US and the Allies were withdrawing from Afghanistan after 20 years of war there. Thousands of billions of dollars wasted in an effort to create a better Afghanistan. Perhaps some seeds of hope were left there behind. But Putin was seeing those images and he saw weak West quarreling, arguing, Europeans talking about the strategic autonomy, i.e. autonomy from US. Uh, seeing those images, he thought that he, the moment is ripe for action. <coughs> He has been, had been thinking about Ukraine for years. Ukraine was there, important. And annoyingly to Putin, uh, Ukraine was managing to get rid of some of the corruption. Economic growth was picking up a bit. So Ukraine basically symbolized the alternative future that Russia had lost. And the hatred towards Ukraine is hatred of that alternative. Because that alternative would not have a place for a leader like Putin. So the hostility, the amount of aggression can be explained by
by Putin not seeing any future for him or his kinds in the Ukrainian project, in the Ukrainian entering into world outside of uh, Soviet and Russian imperialism. And of course, in Finland, we were viewing this very carefully. We saw the outbreak of the war as terrifying. Even the US that had correctly predicted the outbreak of the war, the US intelligence was right. There was some European skepticism towards it, but uh, clearly, the US got it right. But the, what the US got wrong was uh, the national unity of Ukraine. They were expecting the Afghanistan scenario to happen again, the collapse of the Ukrainian government in a speed seen in, in Afghanistan only a few months before. So when uh, Americans were offering the evacuation helicopters for Zelensky, president of Ukraine, it was logical for Americans trying to guarantee the continuation of the government outside of borders of Ukraine. But of course, Zelensky famously answered that telephone call by saying that we don't need helicopters, we need weapons. But remember that point was important. We were worried about the collapse of Ukraine. Remember that there were three states on the Russian western border that did not be, uh, be, uh, that weren't members of NATO, they were Ukraine, Belarus, and Finland. So if Ukraine would have collapsed, you can see the scenario there. So the, it was intensive moment. And the release of the tension came when we saw that in every Ukrainian village and city, Ukrainians were resisting. That reminded quite a lot of things about our own historical experience, the strategic culture of Finland, the story of Finland. We are not only world-class society. Finland is the most educated, the most egalitarian, the least corrupted, the most stable, high-trust society. You could go on and on with the different rankings. We're also the happiest country <laughs> in the world. Finns are very skeptical about this. <laughs> because if we are the happiest, then how miserable others must be. <laughs> um, but it is a sentiment of being quite OK with your bleak, harsh surroundings. That's the key to Finnish happiness. That world-class society. It was a geostrategic tactic after the Second World War, after nearly losing the war to the Soviet Union. It was a great defensive victory in a sense that Finland was never taken over by the Soviets. You can all remember Winter War ads and Winter War and the resistance has always been in the hearts and minds of Finns. If you look to the history of Finland, it's bleak, brutal. It's not as bleak and brutal as the Ukrainian history, but still, it is a history of being a target of imperialism, a Russian imperialism. Finland has always adopted the westernmost position available to it. And after the end of the Cold War, we joined the European Union. We thought that perhaps the times have changed and we don't have to shoot, uh, shoot uh, chai, uh, sides because Russia is normalizing. That perhaps cooperative security solutions can be available for different types of scenarios. We learned quite well to talk about European security in terms of cooperative security. That was the other side of the coin without naming any potential enemies, without naming Russia. 
We develop good relations. That was one of the uh, cornerstones of Finnish foreign policy, to have good relations with Russia, especially trading relations. At the same time, we were building defensive cooperation with, with the West, with Sweden, with US. So that was the other side of the coin. The side of the coin connecting with the, the long-standing historical memories in the Finnish Peninsula. During the Cold War years, the westernmost position available to Finland was neutrality. Soviet Union never recognized Finnish neutrality. They always referred in statements to Finnish neutrality in uh, phrases like Finland aspires to be a neutral country. For Soviets, Finland was a window dressing lure tactic to make other more Western countries to join in in cohabitation, coexistence with with the uh, Soviet Union. Finlandization as a term is a curse word in Finland. I remember just before the war, the first wave of uh, international media attention that came to Finnish Institute of International Affairs where the phone calls uh, when some defensive realists had suggested Finlandization as a model for Ukraine. So journalists were calling Helsinki asking what, what, what is Finlandization and uh, it wasn't an optimal policy for, to be recommended to any other country basically. Sphere of influence under other disguise. So that was the answer and Finland has always remained in a position that it can apply to NATO. So the open door policy of NATO has been a vital part that Finland has tried to maintain. That option, the leeway of the, uh, having the right to apply, is the, also the cornerstone of European security order. That even the smaller countries have right to decide when it comes to their position vis-a-vis uh, security solutions. NATO was there, it was available, Finland was getting closer to NATO, it was getting closer to US, but at the same time it was maintaining the leeway by having relatively good relations even after 2014 with Russia. But when the neighbor starts a war in the neighborhood, then of course things start to change. Seeing the resistance of the Ukrainians, the unity of the country, logically drawing conclusions from that, uh, logically meant that Finns decided to join NATO. And it was kind of a bottom-up process. But you have to remember that uh, keeping the option open was a top-down process. So both of those were needed. But the citizens of the Republic decided to change their mind when they saw what Russia is all about. The President of Finland phrased this not in a long televised hour long or 15 minutes, even 15 minutes long television speeches, televised speeches, but by simple slogans. He said, masks are, have been taken off and Putin should look to the mirror what Finland does next. Finland is very encrypted in the sense that everything would translate in their minds simple slogans into very long speeches about Finnish history, about Finnish experience. You don't have to, you have to just say the password and things start to happen. When it comes to Finnish role in NATO, I think geography matters, location always is the key to geopolitics, so from Kola Peninsula to the Saint, uh, gates of St. Petersburg to the Gulf of Finland, one of the most strategically important straits in Northern Europe, to Holland Islands, that's going to define the Finnish role in NATO. 
when it comes to the one side of the coin, when it comes to deterrence. The other side, cooperative security is now far more limited, rather is on a for, uh, war footing. So there simply is no negotiation table available out there. So cooperative security has to do about the Western, the European, the EU, NATO, transatlantic multilateralism. And then trying to get a better hold when it comes to the rest of the world. Russia is there not as a negotiation part, partner, but as a potential geopolitical threat. One thing that is easy for Finns, our security equation is not as complicated as the US one. US has over 70 allies, militarily allied countries all over the globe. And uh, you have priority lists that are much more complicated to devise than what the Finns have. Our security equation is very simple. There's only one potential geopolitical foe. We need to be prepared, and Finland always has been, even during the times of uh, neutrality, we were prepared. It would have been difficult, but the Finnish culture, the strategic culture, has always been sensing signals coming from uh, the eastern neighbor. And we have always been ready. Militarily, Finland is strong, one of the strongest northern European states. The wartime army is around uh, 300,000. We have modern weapons systems. But usually we don't highlight that aspect of Finland much. Because there's the other aspect, the other side, cooperative security being on top of the world, kind of an exodus from the geopolitical map to the world of uh, innovation economy, where we excel. And we have done quite well by any measure. But the other side, the first side, and I think kind of the key side to understanding Finland, the more stoic, much more Spartan side, is there present. And it was woken by Russia last spring when it started the war. So that's going to be a defining aspect of Finnish NATO role from the Finnish side. But of course it is give and take. Reciprocity is important here. So NATO can be understood as a marketplace of security demands and security supplying. And in that game, of course, it matters how Washington sees Finnish role in NATO. So it's not only for Finland to define. We can clearly see certain stable characteristics in the scenario, like the border. We can see Finland opening up to the north, perhaps having national resilience corridor through Sweden and, and Norway to the, uh, to the north, to the Arctic Sea, opening up towards the south across the Gulf of Finland. Orland Island is another corridor through, to Sweden that is very important. So things are changing very rapidly. And those elements of change, we have to tap into those. So what does a modern innovation society, what can, can it do when it comes to chasing geopolitical facts, the harshness of the situation into something that is an opportunity, that gives some uh, results for the citizens of Finland, sense of uh, shelter and security. And that's the key to how Finns identify with NATO. We are not going to be kind of a passive members of NATO, I'm sure of that. So Finland didn't reluctantly join NATO. We strongly signaled our desire to join NATO. So we are going to be an active NATO member. And that activity is 
part of the equation that I just referred? What are the, how the key partners see our NATO role and how our, uh, we ourselves define it, part of that equation? Sweden, still unfinished business. I hope that Sweden can get in during the summer. Uh, time is getting tight. Turkey needs to change its mind. Finns were, I think, carefully analyzing the situation and they decided to do what Finns usually do. We are very pragmatic. So you do what you can and you do that always better. Foreign policy is based on pragmatic ethics. And uh, negotiating with Turkey was a wise decision, I think. And Sweden, I hope, can reach a negotiation, a good solution with uh, the present Turkish government or the next Turkish government after the elections. Delegating, and we're saying to the US that can, can you negotiate on our behalf? Can you put pressure on Turkey? Can you sell them some fighter planes, for example? Would have been a cheap option. Delegation usually doesn't work on the longer term. Paid love never lasts very long. So the Turks actually had to understand by themselves through negotiations with Finland the importance of Finland joining NATO. And they did. And I'm sure that many other countries understood the situation as well. That it is understandable, considering the history of Finland, that Finland joins NATO. And to conclude, Finland always adopts the westernmost position available to it. And once again, it did just that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mika. Um, uh, thank you for a very comprehensive overview of Finland's security situation and indeed Europe's security situation. Um, I think you did miss out one important uh, development, which is, of course, that Finland is through to the finals of the Eurovision Song Contest <laughs> as, as of last night, uh, an, an, another important European institution. And I see that the, the betting markets say Finland is second favorite to win, but... Um, Who is the first? Uh, Sweden is first. So, you know, <laughs> you, you, got, you got NATO, they, they get Eurovision. I mean, it's, it's so, sort of traditional. Um, let, me, let me ask, uh, we'll chat for about 50, 15 minutes or so, and then I'd, I'd love to bring in questions from the floor. Um, the first question I, I'd like to ask is, Clearly, Russia's aggression against Ukraine accelerated Finland's move towards NATO. But you know, leading Finnish statesmen, such as uh, former President Akhtisari, had floated the idea of entering NATO in the past. Um, is this something which, if history was slightly different, would have happened five years from now, ten years from now? Or did, it, did there have to be the war on Ukraine to make this, make this leap? Of course, it's always difficult to uh, change your status and enter into NATO in times of war. And this was actually first for NATO as well. Large scale war, the largest scale war in Europe since the Second World War is currently ravaging in, in, in Ukraine. So, uh, but uh, Machiavelli once said that uh, especially the small, they have to seize the moment. And Finland had been preparing for, you know, doing this. Uh, perhaps the public wasn't prepared, but uh, Russia prepared the public uh, very well. Um, it was seismic, the shift. I could feel it almost bodily, how the opinions were changing when they saw not perhaps the war itself or the outside of the war, but as I said, what stopped Russia in Ukraine was nationality. It was the Ukrainians. It wasn't the weapons because they weren't there yet. It was the sense of national unity. And that, of course, you know, reminded Finns that, well, we have that. Finland has always appreciated consensus when it comes to foreign policy. 
there might have been a moment of uh, unsteadiness, uh, but that moment was brief. And, and uh, if I would be a future historian looking 10 years from now, what happened, perhaps I wouldn't even notice that perhaps one month there was a bit of a ambiguity and, and, uh, and uh, uh, disagreements what to do next. There were different models. I remember when I was in the corridors of the parliament giving advice to the uh, different committees of the parliament, different po political parties of the government, uh, to, of Finnish state. There were three options, uh, staying put, but of course that was crossed out because it would be actually saying yes to the Russian demands of spheres of influence. Uh, second option was uh, some kind of a minilateral defense arrangement with US, UK, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, kind of a, what I called uh, um, a Nordic uh, fortress that would have a close relationship with NATO. And then the NATO as a third option. Uh, after a couple of weeks, it was uh, clear to Finns that actually creating something new, the Nordic fortress in the middle of war, uh, is, is much more difficult than joining an existing international organization. Uh, so it started to make more and more sense uh, to Finns. It was a logical co conclusion that was reached very, very quickly. Um, but of course, much uh, of the Finnish role that I was, uh, uh, that I missed out in my speech, you know, there's going to be a heavy emphasis on, on multilateralism still. Uh, Finland sees that multilateral tissue solidifies uh, international settings and uh, grants also special or equalizes the positions between big and small. So that is going to remain there. Uh, emphasis on, 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 on multilateral, different new types of uh, flexible arrangements. Um, so that's going to remain, it's going to be part of the NATO role as well. And I mean, maybe you can help uh, explain a mystery, which is, uh, despite Finland making this very rapid move into NATO, which is clearly not in Russia's interests, um, the Russian reaction has been surprisingly passive. And we haven't heard the sort of vitriol from, from Russia towards Finland that we have heard from Russia towards other European countries, such as my own country, the UK. Um, why do you think Russia has actually been so moderate in its response to what is clearly a strategic um, uh, setback for, for Moscow? Well, I, I think it's uh, simple to explain. Uh, they still remember Winter War. They still remember that Finland actually has a uh, strength to it. Uh, Finland currently has the highest willingness to defend in the world. 85% of Finns are willing to defend the country, even if uh, the outcome would be uncertain. That's very high. Uh, so what, what is there for us to do? Finland is all, also a relatively homogeneous society, so that we don't have cleavages that they can then uh, abuse. Finland is encrypted, even the language is encrypted. So, so trolling and, and, and uh, misinformation and disinformation, it's a little bit harder in a country like Finland. Uh, so we are relatively solid and Russia is getting weaker. So they have pulled off the troops from the uh, Finnish, uh, across the border to Finnish Lapland for, for uh, garrisons in the Kola Peninsula, in Karelia, uh, emptied to the to uh, slaughter that is happening in Ukraine. Um, the one thing that I would like to remind people that, that there are two different approaches in Finland to, to what is happening in Ukraine. Other one, one uh, the first one is, is uh, that they see this as a kind of a, the last phase of a Soviet collapse, that it is kind of a war between the last remnants of, of Soviet Union that it doesn't have any implications, wider implications than that. It's between Russians and Ukrainians. I don't believe in that theory. I, I clearly see that Russia ha is an expansive power 
aggressive. It saw a moment of opportunity, it tried to use that, and it ended up in a disaster. It's going to destabilize Russia for a long time, uh, but I think that theory is much uh, more applicable. Russia was hungry, and one day it needs to feel overextended and overexhausted. Perhaps then there's a moment for the negotiation table, but uh, I don't think that Russia is ready yet. Um, and, and that explains quite a lot of how Finland is currently behaving. Um, I remember that I think in a, in a seminar in April or May of last year, someone suggested that one way that Russia could hurt Finland would be to cut off um, its timber exports to Finland. And this struck me as not a very good argument, because if there's one thing Finland has, it's trees. <laughs> well, if this is your strongest, uh, if this yes. is your strongest card, uh, you're not in a good position. Uh, some, some nuisance they can do, of course. Uh, we could, should be worried about the undersea data cables, for example. Uh, Russians have been practicing on cutting those, and Finland is very dependent on, 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 on them. They, most likely it was the Russians who exploded their own gas pipeline, so perhaps they were sending messages that they can explode some other pipelines as well. So that's kind of my bottommost worry. Uh, uh, kind of a military attack to Finland uh, would lead into a further disaster to Russia. Um, now, one, one more question uh, that I think touches on Finland in NATO as a now a treaty ally of the United States. Um, you mentioned that you know, the US has m many security priorities. And obviously the overriding priority in Washington now is not actually Russia, it's China. Um, and we're seeing uh, the US push NATO to sort of become tougher towards China. Um, and also we're seeing a lot of debate in Europe about uh, some of the dangers perhaps of, of trading with China. Um, now, certainly before COVID, it was very notable that Finland was developing an extremely positive economic relationship with, with Beijing. I mean, any of you who went through Vantar Airport, when you entered the international part of Vantar, it felt like you had entered Asia um, because there were so many flights. Um, it, it was one of the best places to get noodles um, near the Arctic Circle. Um, how, do you think Finland can walk that fine line, or do you think there's going to be an internal debate in Finland about how to deal with China going forward? Well, uh, the U.S. angle is, is relatively clear that, uh, that if uh, you think that the main objective of U.S. Uh, geostrategic posture has always been to stop uh, a peer competitor from emerging, so Obviously, there's only one possibility. So in that sense, the U.S. security uh, calculations are quite uh, simple as well. It's China. Uh, but uh, and, uh, there's no Europe first po policy currently. But I, I think that there is still in, in the Biden administration a sense that uh, Russia and China are connected. And, and, and one needs to deal with uh, Ukraine first. Uh, before there can be any 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 uh, good solution with uh, with China, um, and then there are some some perhaps weaknesses that that the U.S. doesn't want to spread its resources too wide. So the Arctic is one arena. You know, when uh, Russia and China were meeting, the presidents were meeting before the war. Arctic was the word that was repeated in the statement the most. So China is viewing the Arctic and access to the Northern Atlantic, and the U.S. should realize that. So um, it's difficult to separate global conflicts, and one tends to attract another. So uh, uh, war, large-scale war, tempts great powers like uh, flypaper, tempts flies. So they find more and more interests in, in them. So the global ramifications of the war in Ukraine are clear. Both Russia and China, they want to change the world order. Russia is much more aggressive, front-loading the challenge, and, and, uh, and uh, China has been more uh, sophisticated, trying to change the system from within. But 
how the Russian challenge will cope, what is the outcome of the, uh, the war aggression in, in Ukraine, clearly sets uh, examples for China as well. And I, I think that there's still, even though the first priority is China, there's still an understanding that it is a nexus of things that the uh, US is dealing with. And uh, luckily, we Europeans have transatlantic relations and partners. So the European aut autonomy from US, I, it's a little bit of a crazy idea. Like we could pick and choose how to be autonomous from US. Uh, the main question has to do with what US actually decides uh, how autonomous it is from Europe. In the next presidential elections here, you know, we could see an outcome that the US is much more autonomous from Europe. Uh, so that's one worry that I have. So NATO is not a rose garden, so we still have to be aware. And, uh, we have to learn to play the uh, politics of NATO inside NATO, but also put some X to the uh, European Union baskets, uh, just to, to make sure that uh, more isolationist uh, US um, that we can cope in a situation like that. Now, US has been vital for the European defense. Once again. Um, and just to ask a, a parochial New York question, um, what about... about Eurovision? Uh, not about Eurovision. <laughs> um, uh, no, about, uh, um, about the United Nations. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned that obviously in Europe, the idea of cooperative security is... Uh, uh, on life support, frankly, at the moment, um, given Russia's actions. But, you know, Finland has long had a reputation uh, as a significant player in the United Nations system here in New York, um, and not only on security issues, but also on questions like promoting women's rights. Uh, do you think that the shift into NATO will affect um, Finland's interests in those sort of global issues, um, or will will Finland be able to work on both the global and the European scale in parallel? Well, yes, uh, you know, uh, I said that, uh, that Finland is uh, the most egalitarian uh, country in the world, and it's not simply because of French Revolution and the spread of uh, liber uh, liberalism to northern uh, reaches of Europe. It's about the country itself. Uh, we have been a target of imperialism, so there hasn't been any privileges, any possibility to grant certain citizens special privileges. That's the, the root of Finnish egalitarian attitudes, and those are not going to go away. And, and Finns talk ec egalitarianism naturally, uh, so it's not contrived. It's not uh, something that uh, is not natural uh, to us. So I'm sure that there's going to be an emphasis on that also in the future. Um, and, and being on top of the world on multiple scales, uh, so there is uh, something to sell. Um, so the, that's not going to disappear uh, anywhere. There's going to be an emphasis on the defense side of things. Uh, but Finland is a country of extreme defense. The offensive side of deterrence is a little bit uh, difficult for us. We, Finnish language doesn't have a word for that. Uh, we used the I would translate deterrence into Finnish using the English word obstacle, creating obstacles, you know, closing the border by setting some stones there. That's, that's the kind of a Finnish mindset, so we don't harbor any intentions of attacking Russia or provoking uh, Russia. Um, so, um, and that fits well into the kind of a cooperative security mindset as well. And Russians know this very well, so perhaps that's one of the reasons why they are not that eager to, to provoke, uh, provoke uh, Finns um, uh, and Finland. Um, the challenge still remains the Swedish membership. Uh, that's, that's very important to us. Uh, they usually do better in Eurovision than we do. Uh, but remember that uh, the Finnish happiness is uh, quality of bleakness, uh, quantum of solace. Uh, so if we lose in the Eurovision, you know, life goes on. Uh, it always happens. We have only one uh, once. Well, now, now maybe your your second chance. Um, 
we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions from the floor. So I, I see there's a roving, a roving microphone. Um, who would like to come in with, with a question? I, see. I think we'll, maybe we'll take two or three questions and then Mika can answer them together. Sato. Hi, Sato. Uh, Finn working for bilateral issues here in the United States and also at the UN. So I have a question regarding the multilateral institutions. Uh, any thoughts on uh, the future of OSCE? Uh, what about the UN Security Council? Russia sits there as one of the permanent members. How do you see that kind of develop in the future? Thank you. And please. Uh, right at the end, you sort of addressed my question, which was about provocation. Uh, so, from Russia's point of view, a solid Nordic bloc in NATO is, I think, considered a provocation just on its own. Um, so, I, I guess I'm curious about discussions about that in the decision to join NATO. If, if you catch my drift, how important was the factor that Russia would at least consider itself provoked, even though, from the Nordic point of view, maybe it doesn't look that way, but from the Russian point of view, it is quite provocative. And are there any, can I get one more question from this side of the room? Thank you very much, Hades Kruderos Fox. I've lived here about 20 years working for the UN, so my question goes towards the UN as well. So um, you talked about the, the kind of internal, how it has changed things in Finland, the preparation, the new strategies and so on that you're working on. And at the same time, when I look at what is discussed here at the UN, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what I read, for example, in the Finnish newspapers, is very much about, you know, Russia being alone or more or less alone. But I think the perspective is different when you look at the UN. And in particular, when you look into the South and Africa and other Southeast Asian countries and so on. So you can clearly see that as the um, others are maybe moving away from multilateralism, China and Russia are taking the place and are very actively uh, moving towards uh, these developing countries. So how in the midst of this new um, security situation, NATO membership, and focus on that in Finland, should a country like Finland focus on its policies in Africa as well, in order to make sure that we don't have more and more countries voting together with Russia when it comes to the UN uh, resolutions. Thank you. Okay, perhaps Richard can add, add to my answer, answer because you know Security Council so well, uh, the foremost expert in, in, in the world on these matters. And uh, uh, amusingly ironic as well in, in social media commenting, so it's always fun to read Richard's postings. Um, well, Finland has a story to tell uh, in the global south. Uh, we haven't been a colonial power. As I said, we have been a target of imperialism. We have a human story, and sometimes we focus too much on, on, on being on top of the world and lecturing on, on, on how good we are. That's very boring. Um, so you have to attach being on top of the world to the human story. And then that rings a bell. It, it, it makes an impression. So not all Europeans are not only former great powers. They are also countries like Finland. Uh, and that resonates much better, kind of comp combining these two aspects, the both sides of the coin. Uh, um, and I'm not to only talking about the modern innovation economy, but also how difficult it was to reach the top of the world in, in the middle of uh, geopolitical pressures for centuries. Um, Russia is active in different ways. Wagner is very active in Africa. Uh, as well as uh, Russian diplomats. Uh, but I, I think that mostly, uh, you know, war travels always uh, badly. Um, the further you go from the vortex of the war, uh, the, less, uh, the less that interests you, the more there's regional other issues. 
It caused a moment of solidarity in Europe. Transatlantically, it was a very powerful impulse, but it didn't, didn't resonate all over, and, and perhaps we shouldn't even demand that. When I went to India, you know, uh, Indians have been lack, lacklust uh, when it comes to solidarity. They have close relations with Russia historically because they see China as the key problem. The borders, uh, the troops from the Pakistani border have been uh, moved to the Chinese border. Uh, and they don't want to choose a side because uh, they want to have the freedom to maneuver. It gives benefits. Uh, so perhaps we shouldn't even expect all the countries to always agree with us. Um, and then uh, we are, have to also uh, respect our solidarity is missing. In the case of India, when they had that low intensity war uh, in Himalayas uh, 2020, where was the European solidarity? We were aware of uh, you know, losing quite a lot of uh, um, vested interest uh, in China. So we, were, we weren't expressing any democratic uh, solidarity uh, towards India. And they remember that. Uh, so uh, we have to kind of uh, remember the law of karma uh, in this respect. Uh, so be consistent in the messaging and don't expect everybody to agree. For us it is important uh, because if Russia would have succeeded, uh, the end result would have been uh, spheres of influence and usually spheres of influence are only precursors to larger war. That's the European kind of a lesson learned. So kind of a stopping that was in a vital Finnish national interest. Um, so um, that's a good point. Provoking, uh, Finns uh, have a saying that if somebody provokes you, don't get provoked. So it's a stoic country and we are very elliptic. We don't yell aloud about these things. Um, um, Finnish NATO membership, I remember 2014 I said that there's two ways that Finland can join NATO. Uh, the first one was that the times are so tranquil, like in early 2000s, uh, that even Russia was considering NATO membership. Uh, that it doesn't matter to Russia that Finland joins. But it was, of course, very difficult to see that that would happen. The other uh, thing that I said was that if the war in Ukraine would escalate, then Finland would join, do an emergency joining of, of, of NATO. And that happened. In nine months, Finland joined. That was a world record, by the way. Finns like to do those. Um, so um, um, we don't have uh, any constraints. There's no self-imposed restrictions in, in the NATO membership. So it's not the Norway way of joining NATO. It's, it, it, it is without any uh, self-imposed restrictions. Uh, we are not self-deterring ourselves. Uh, and Russia knows that. And in the future, I think the Finnish eastern border is going to be based on deterrence. Uh, Russia, at its best one day after decades, can be a bonus to Finnish economy, but we are not going to forget that Russia abuses dependencies. Uh, and that's the kind of a lesson that should be learned from this, that let's not open too much the Finnish society. There perhaps was a little bit uh, too much of, of different uh, trade-related uh, mistakes, strategic mistakes. Finnair was one of those. Uh, uh, important Finnish company that uh, that strategy was based on the overflight rights over Russia. So Russia could take those easily away. We also participated in the building of the Nord Stream gas pipelines. It wasn't in the best interest of Finland. And we were uh, thinking about building uh, Rosatom, Russian state-owned company's nuclear power plant in, in northern Finland. So uh, a, little bit, a little bit too much coziness. Uh, but at the same time, Finland was uh, defense-wise approaching West. So it was perhaps uh, balancing that a bit, and it came to trade relations and being optimistic about Russia. It was called the politics of hope. 
and uh, people will always say that, you know, what's wrong with being hopeful about Russia? Well, you know, it costs quite a lot of tax taxpayers' money. Uh, that's what was wrong about being hopeful. Um, just sat on your question about the Security Council. Um, it's welcome because it gives me a chance to be nice about another Nordic nation. I mean, we've, we've, we've had some fun about Sweden, but, um, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about Russia and China's behavior since February of last year is that while there have been really nasty fights in the Security Council over Ukraine, I mean, more than 60 debates about Ukraine, all of them poisonous, the Russians seem to have made a decision that they are going to keep working with Western countries through the Security Council on some other issues, like um, Afghanistan, um, uh, like Haiti, even peacekeeping in, in Africa. Um, and last year, as you know, Norway was on the Security Council, and Norway actually had a really fascinating role um, because, you know, in Europe, Norway was um, you know, a solid member of the NATO response to Russia's war, but here, behind the scenes, the Norwegians worked you know, pretty closely with, with the Russians, with the Chinese, um, to make sure that diplomacy didn't break down over, over Afghanistan, for example. Um, and I think that role was appreciated by everyone, um, very much including uh, the US. Now, I think that going forward, I mean, Finland, is set to join the Security Council in about five, five years, I think. I think countries will still be looking to the Nordic countries to, to play that role here, which is a traditional Nordic role at the UN. And I think Norway shows you that you can do that even though you are a, um, a NATO member. So, uh, I mean, I actually, I, to be honest, I mean, I asked you about it. I don't think that NATO membership is going to massively affect Finnish, uh, the Finnish position at the UN. Um, because uh, you know, the tradition of Nordic diplomacy at the UN is, is very strong, and I think it is still appreciated. So you can take some examples from, from Norway on, on that too. So, yeah, I, to, to add to that, I, I think it's also fair to say that perhaps uh, Russia is not interested in some forms of multilateralism. Uh, so they, when it comes to Baltic Sea, they just left the cooperation there. So, so nothing could keep them in the, in the, on that table. Arctic Council remains to be seen what happens uh, with that, but it's going to be on a very low level. Uh, and even that might be futile. Uh, you know, Russia simply today is not acting in good faith. There can be some transactional uh, things like in the Black Sea grain deal. That was important uh, uh, achievement as well, but it's transactional. Uh, it's not in the spirit of, of multilateralism. Uh, uh, it's, it's more of, a, of what can we gain in this or that. Other tables we will leave, and that applies to OSCE as well. So, you know, Finland is, uh, takes a lot of pride over Helsinki spirit and, and uh, 75 OSCE, uh, Helsinki Security Conference. Uh, that, that was important achievement. We have ownership over that. Uh, but that's, that spirit doesn't exist currently. Perhaps it will come back, but it only comes back when Russia feels that it is overextended and overexhausted. So very realistic interpretation that I have on, 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 on how the, that moment might come. Now we have the Siberian spirits that are blowing. And perhaps the country also needs some relief. So if Finland would actually win Eurovision, uh, you know, after pandemic and and uh, after the war, I think it's just uh, a little bit of a moment of relaxation. We didn't, by the way, celebrate the NATO membership very openly because in Finland it, uh, it means bad luck if you celebrate something. Uh, uh, so it was very kind of a low-key secret gatherings here and there celebrating uh, a clear achievement. Uh, we're a very stoic nation. Uh, uh, but uh, Eurovision Song Contest, I think that would lead into more open expressions of joy because it actually doesn't matter and it doesn't bring bad luck. Well, and, and also I, um, in preparation for today, I, I read the lyrics of the Eurovision entry from Finland 
um, which is not very stoic. Yeah, um, it's, it's about drinking. It, and at, at one point, I think it's in Finnish, but the lyrics are, um, I have left behind a world of fear, now I am going to pour champagne over myself. So um, I think we've talked a little bit about uh, the world of fear in which Finland finds itself. And I, I don't think you should pour champagne over yourself to celebrate entering NATO, but it clearly has been a huge strategic and political shift. And thank you so much, Mika, for um, talking us through it. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> thank you, Mika and Richard. Fascinating. Uh, and we'll be keeping an eye on how things develop. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you have a moment, you may like to look at our exhibition, which is one floor above us, Arctic Highways, which features the work of 12 indigenous artists, uh, some from Finland, Sami from Finland, but also from Norway, Sweden, Canada, and Alaska. So take a look at it or come back. It'll be up until July 28th. And we have many other activities going on here. So check amscan.org or scandinaviahouse.org to see what's going on and come back soon. Thank you very much.